Without Sean. Changing the game Without through Sean. real estate. Yeah. Changing the game through real estate. I can never wait. Got what it takes. I got this on my plate. And I got a budget. Teach you how to save. Listen to this podcast. You will be amazed. Play this any morning, any night, any day. We're the winning team. We were born to be brave. Yeah. Changing the game through real estate. Yeah. Today we are talking with Tim Churchwell. Tim Churchwell is a former New York Stock Exchange manager. He's currently on the Virginia Economic Advisory Board and the president of the CCIM chapter of Mid Atlantic. I'll let Tim be able to tell you more about his resume in his past. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today, by the way. Uh, as far as what I do, I think you kind of summed up most of it, anyhow. Uh, as far as the past, I was uh, not a New York Stock Exchange manager. I was a New York Stock Exchange branch manager. There's a big difference there. So, and, uh, so I did that, got out of that, I uh, was looking for something to do, and got into real estate and fell in love with real estate. You know? And when you're looking at the capital markets, commercial real estate, you know, and the stock market, the bond market, capital markets is all about where the money's going to flow. So sometimes it's into stocks, sometimes into bonds, sometimes it's into commercial real estate. So what made you kind of get into like the finance real estate game? Like what drove you to all this? Well, it's funny. Uh, I was looking for something to do. Actually, when I first got out of securities, I was consulting. I was living on the road. And I it. You know, I'm very much family oriented and community oriented. And I had a, at the time I had a six year old son. And I wanted to see him more. Uh, I became president of the Smith Rotary Club and things like that. They were very active in the church. And but you can't do all that when you get on a phone on Sunday opening up. Uh, so uh, I had some clients in the past uh, that were into real estate and they always told me that as they said I should get into dirt. So mm-hmm. I low barriers to entry, right? To get into to become a real estate agent. Very low barriers to entry and essentially challenge your own business. Which I needed to do because at that point in time, uh, I couldn't work for somebody else. So, <laughs> so that end uh, did very well on the residential side. But because of my background, I got dragged into commercial and quickly learned that it's a whole different world. You don't even know what you don't know out there. Right. And so, you know, and I've got two things. One, if somebody's entrusting me, I got to make sure they're not the best of everything. The second thing is, I don't believe in doing harm for the harm. I'm not going to act like I know something like that. Okay. So I looked into it, and also at the time, my manager at the time also kind of pushed me. Uh, Virginia Scott, shout out to her. <laughs> and to push me to do the CCIM push. She goes, Tim, you want to be the best, this is the best. So I started taking CCIM classes, and I would refer commercial deals out to CCIM to say, hey, let me help work it. One, you need a free portfolio. It's not all about classes and CCI. You need a free portfolio as well. So I said, let me help work the deal. And, uh, and I refer it to you. And also, you know, that helps me from the CCI purpose. So I'll just chime in for a minute. For our listeners who don't know what CCI is, could you explain that a little bit? CCI <laughs> stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. And essentially, it's about 200 postgraduate level hours of. Uh, Commercial real estate education. Uh, its emphasis is on investment properties, though it does cover user analysis uh, and leasing as well. And so you take all these classes, you also have to submit a portfolio, close business transactions to the institute. They grade that portfolio. If you did it up to CCIM standards, then you're allowed to buy in some comprehensive exam. 
So it's considered the highest designation of the school. Okay, and then with that, do you get any add-ons? Is there any like presentations or insider information that you get? I mean, insider information might be a, a yeah, kind of but <laughs> don't use that term. <laughs> <laughs> this is a stock broker, it's a yeah. so subject, I'm sure. But what, what are the benefits as someone who's a CCIM member compared to someone who's not? Well, one, the education is valuable, obviously. But the second thing is just the network. Uh, I mean, you know, I go to these CCIM conferences and I'm just in awe of the quality of the people there. And CCIMs as well are notorious for, which, for helping each other out. First and foremost, you go to CCIM. We're even developing a website right now, a listing service, just for CCIMs. So you know that there's a CCIM on the other side of the deal when you're doing the deal. And so the networking is phenomenal, plus other tools as well. Uh, there's a lot of software analytics that we get that's provided to us for being a member. Uh, we get a few things that other commercial agents can't that aren't CCIMs. Uh, for instance, in our chapter, we're listing a monthly. Uh, deals in virtual deals and drinks session. So when I get a listing, you know, I can put it on there versus somebody that's not a CCI. And it goes out to some of the top producing agents and buyers throughout the Middle Atlantic. And by Middle Atlantic, I'm talking about Virginia, DC, Maryland, and West Virginia. So, so you're not, like when you get a deal, you don't necessarily have to put straight on the MLS or anything like that. From a university, they have to, like, you can't start marketing. So two days before it goes by one of the class or something like that. So what's what's the yeah, like that? it's kind of tricky. Um I will tell you I'm one of the few uh explicitly commercial agents in the country list. There's maybe five of us that actually market some of MLS. Uh, and I do that because of the syndication value of it. Yeah. And in addition to that, you know, it goes up residential agents stuff over it yeah, sometimes. So they see my listings versus somebody, you know, versus because they're not going to pay six thousand dollars a year to get a post star. Yeah. Uh, you guys are is the <clears throat> excuse me, the commercial listing side portal, they, correct? CoStar basically has a monopoly in the industry. Uh, they own uh, they also own the uh, uh, the not every property that's in CoStar would be on the account. But every property that's in the account is on CoStar. They're also a research company. They do a great job. But they do have a monopoly on it. You have to subscribe to those services uh, just to help your clients. In yeah, addition, that there are a few other resources out there as well. It's a good for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it costs a lot to make money. Yeah. I spend about $1,500 a month just on the software and stuff like that. Right. So, and what other uh, sources are there? I know everyone in the does commercial kind of knows CoStar, but there's some other finite ones that maybe someone who's not as experienced knows. Well, first and foremost, a lot of it is about who you know and networking with other people, you know, which is the case probably with any business. But we do a lot of deals with each other. You know, we'll put it, we, and then we might put it online, but for the most part, it's, you know, I'm picking up the phone and calling my associates, my cohorts, you know, my other CCIMs, brokers, and this includes brokers of other firms as well, and saying, okay, hey, you know, I've got this kind of market. Uh, but some other resources include. Well, you've got the CCIM deal sharing network. You've got Crexy, uh, which is they are they do a wonderful job with competitors with Coastar. Once they start seeing them, they start seeing all the competitors. Uh, <laughs> well, Coastar also owns apartments.com. Mm -hmm. They bought it's the Star Reports for the hotel industry. And now they bought, I think it's Homes Map or Homes something. Oh, yeah, they're going to enter yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. the residential. I'm going to say they're going to residential. Yeah. They're the um, Amazon of business services. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they definitely have the analytics of it, that's for sure. Yeah. I know what they're doing. Those are the three main ones, but there are a ton of other ones. There's OfficeSpace.com if you're looking for office space, especially if you're a tenant. Uh, there's Land and the Rocks, Land.com. There's, there's, there are quite a few different sites out there. Uh, if you're a CCIM, you also get this kind of from most of those sites. There's another benefit. Exactly. So, as buyers, as everyone that's in the market trying to buy right now, we're seeing some absolutely obtuse and obscure offers that you don't actually understand how they're making any profit, which is leading into what people call cap rate compression. Can you please explain that and you know, what we can see for the future? Well, the cap rate compression, essentially interest rates have gone up, but the cap rates have not. 
And, you know, real estate is one of the very few places that has an inflation fraud issues. So investors are desperate for return, and they're throwing their money into deals that maybe don't make sense because they're just desperate saying, hey, it's real estate, I should be flying into this, especially the smaller players out there. And they, what you have to look at is a cash flow analysis and project that you're sure doing that. But they'll go if people might be doing it now, you know, you're leveraging, that's great. But, and, you know, I just saw, I think we're down to 4.2% cap rate for multi family now. Yeah, yeah. You know, now, that's great if we're going to have a 10%, 10 to 12% increase in rents going forward for a while. But it did cost you 5% to get into the deal on your money. Do you see that rent going up 10 to 12 percent year over year? That's what we're doing for three year projections. <laughs> Number one rule of real estate location, location, location. All right, Always. so it depends on the market. We have seen a lot of markets flowing out your primary markets and flowing into well, first of the secondary, now the tertiary markets. Our market in the Hampton Roads is considered tertiary. So we've seen a lot of money coming down this way going into the tertiary markets because the yields are great. You know, uh, I did an analysis on a portfolio up in New York City for some clients. I also do some consulting and stuff. So did an analysis on the large multifamily portfolio up in New York. And we're talking about class B and class C properties. This was two years ago, three years ago. And they're trying to sell it at a four at a four and a half percent cap rate. You know, back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of those investors flooded out and came to our market at the same time that our market. Six plus percent capital. Yeah, well, once upon a time it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, then, you know, and there's always those even smaller markets get overlooked. I mean, I think I was telling you, Rob, uh, Wilmington, uh, my development partner and I, we looked at a, a development deal from a family down in Wilmington, North Carolina last year, mm -hmm. and we walked away from it. I'm like, well, we just really can't see the returns and to justify that we need it for a development deal. And development has, because it has higher risk. It has higher margins, right? So we walked away from it. Then I see a report a few weeks ago that said that Wilmington, North Carolina had one of the absolutely highest growth rates for rents in the country. Like some of the data is like 26, 20 percent. I'm like, when I shot it to my partner, he's like, yeah, it looks like we missed that one. <laughs> but one thing I tell all my clients, though, and we hold to it ourselves as well, you don't need to catch every ship that sells. You want to make sure you're on the ones that don't sell. Yeah. So, essentially, so. What nowadays is a good investment? Ah, the magical question. Yeah, the standard attorney question. <laughs> that I answer, right? It depends. And it depends on your particular needs, your particular you know, funding, your particular return requirements, and your particular risk. Too many people overlook the risk. I can show you returns that have 20 plus percent you know, potential returns, and you're going to incur a substantial amount of risk to do that. It's also one reason why a lot of people don't get into development, for instance, which carries the highest returns. Uh, so it depends on every, every individual, every institution, their investment needs are different. What's your criteria? What's your risk tolerance? You know, if you're risk, you know, I have one investor, for instance, she is so risk averse, I mean, it's off the charts, risk averse, right? So she wants multi tenant, triple investment, <coughs> multi tenant. Triple net investment. Triple net means that the tenant pays all the fees, and, and she wants national accounts. <laughs> I mean, that's how risky she is. She wow. just wants to just sit back and put the checks and not worry about anything. So, is that realistic for someone to want that in this type of money? Everybody wants it. The issue is with the you want to sacrifice your return to get it. Okay. So, now uh, I just put a market deal on the market. For instance, it's got a national tenant. It's a single tenant. National tenant for you know six point seven five percent cap. It's only four hundred forty thousand. So <laughs> and one unique property or one unique feature of this property as well is the location is rapidly developing. So the, the property is actually probably worth more in user space. So uh, the tenant is in there quite a while. They have some renewals. And, oh, one nice thing about this: five percent annual escalations. Okay. Where is this located? Over in Portsmouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. 4000 George Washington Highway, Portsmouth. It's, it's, a, it's a signalized intersection. 
Awesome. So you're, you're mentioning everything about these criteria and certain little numbers or percentages that people should have. For someone who's just starting off, they have no idea about anything criteria-wise, what should a reasonable criterialist be when they call a group like you? Who you know how much capital you have to invest, know where your funding is coming from, know your risk tolerance, and know your returns. What type of returns are you looking for? Don't just go by cap rate. The problem with cap rate is that it looks at the first year expected rate of return. Right? Well, that's you know, especially in rising interest rates right now. Just so you know, I'm I'm calling for three more rate hikes this year at 50 basis points each, not a quarter each. So, can you explain specifically? That, that what basis points means? Yeah. Right. Uh, half a point. Uh, basis points are, base, uh, are basically, you have 100 basis points and 1%. Okay. So when you're looking at the capital markets, we call them basis points. Can your rates change all the time? Right now? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like not residential like not around 5 to 6. Residential is a little bit higher. Right. Mm -hmm. Investment on the residential is even mm -hmm. higher. Yeah. So, and we're finding sources of funds drying up a lot for investment capital. Uh, you know, I have a client that we went with yesterday, and she got down because of the rising interest rates. A lot, and a lot of investors are pulling out of that side and, uh, because of the interest rates. Are well, the banks being more stringent on the way they do? Yeah. Well, another client we met with yesterday. She made it all the way through underwriting and got approved by underwriting and everything else, but just a loan committee. In commercial real estate, it's not just about underwriting. And every lender is different, by the way. Every lender has different requirements. It's not like residential mortgages. Uh, res and commercial mortgages actually have to pull a piece of the portfolio, too. They can't just set it all out. So they made it all the way through, then they just committed, <clears throat> and they denied it because, because, because of the inefficient market. It's throwing everything in place. And uh, she went. That she, she first did, or it was, it was on her, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is actually a user. So, this is for her to open her business. Gotcha. So, are they being more strict as what are more like, restricted when it comes to giving that personal? Okay, well, we're going to be able to go to an out and network for now. We want to see if we can already want to check. Yep. And commercial real estate is going to get coverage this issue. Yeah. And so, we are seeing that bump up. Uh, one thing you're going to start finding as well, more and more adjustable rates coming back into the market, adjustable rate lines. But from a buyer's perspective, I don't know if I'd do that unless it's really capping out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, I would not be surprised if interest rates go back up to the Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, CPI came out at what, 8.1, the lowest expenses in 1991. But if you look at PPI, which is an advance of CPI, the latest PPI numbers come up. These are price index. So these are the people that actually have to make their you know, what it's costing them now yeah. to pass on for the consumer. That came out at over 12%. So that's going to have to be passed on. So right. that's why I'm saying look out for the industry next. So what do you think people can do? Like, let's say they're just starting out like, trying to get commercial, say they're trying to get from like, large multi family commercial spaces. Like, what's, mm -hmm. like, they see everything happening. How can they go about getting into it? It's already like a part of everything. It's already very little entry. Well, everybody wants to jump into multifamily. They always have. It's the safest investment. Probably the safest investment you can get into. So it is a very competitive market. Just make sure you do your number. But also, you've got to have your back. And you've got to know what you're doing before you go into the deal. Can you get the financing? Are you confident in your financing? What your financing is going to cost you. you know, uh, so you can plug all this into your numbers. But other than that, I mean, it's getting to know people, it's networking, it's forming good relationships and a great team. But you also have a great team. So knowing, you know, knowing and leveraging your abilities like that and getting your foot in the door. But I, I'll tell you, you know, like everybody's calling me. And that's not even the hottest stuff in the market. Industrial is the hottest sector in the market. We are running less than less than half a percent vacancy in our market. Wow, do you foresee that continuing or not? Yes, for the most part, uh, we need more supply coming in, obviously. Uh, but we have the ports here, which is a great benefit to us, right? So 
we also have you know, the rail lines, which you see them because of the supply chain issues. One thing that you're seeing is a lot of companies are pulling back to the United States for supply chain. Okay. And they're going to be, and if they're not, they're still using multiple ports. So Norfolk, Charleston, Louisiana. Uh, I think everybody right now is going to fill up with California. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, but you have to have major rail lines as well to distribute. You know, and so these companies that are manufacturing, they're like, we want our goods, we need them on time so we can sell a product. So you're seeing a lot of that coming back here, yes, States, which is good. It's a lot of good. Amazon, uh, it's funny, Amazon's actually going to slow down a little bit on the warehousing. They said that they, maybe they bought it now. <laughs> but Finally. here's something that a lot of people taking over the world. I know. It's for a couple months. You know, yeah. By the rest of the season. Yeah, that's true. And here's something people don't realize uh, Amazon actually owns it. It's over 30 malls in this country. There's a lot of malls in Vegas in this last year. It's distribution centers. I mean, malls are going extinct, so that's a great way for big storage. I don't think they're going extinct. No? They're changing. You see, a lot of people say that mm -hmm. an article I wrote a couple of years ago, it's not, it's not going away, it's changing. Right. More open air concept. Right. We're going, we are going back to a village type concept. So it'll be mixed use malls. You know, you might have condos and a hotel and like we used to see, actually, believe it or not, you can look right outside my door and see a hotel in the middle of this mall. And so that type of concept. Mm -hmm. The other thing as well is that make grocery store favorite places, yeah. uh, your big discount stores, things like that. So retail's just changed. As a matter of fact, retail had its best year since, uh, or best quarter since the beginning of 2017, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. surprising after COVID because you were seeing a lot of vacancies because we just didn't know the uncertainty. Exactly. So it's coming back, you said? Oh, it's hugely. I mean, it's, you know, almost every day we're getting tenants coming in, but we're up in the future. And it's, yeah, it's huge. Uh, the nominal growth, it outpaced, I think it actually outpaced industrial in the last quarter. I'm not talking about the vacancy, I'm talking about the sales. But when you mentioned industrial, is that, these people buying it for like, Buying it and renting it, or just like around the industry? Just in general. I mean, we've got needs from both sides. Yeah. Well, obviously, because of the demand for occupation for it, and, and tenant demand and user demand. You know, everybody out there is trying to buy it, you know, whether they want to use it for themselves. I've got two companies right now, and we're talking about seven figure purchases, but we can't find anything to buy for on the industrial side. Nothing. You know, uh, I called up a buddy of mine who had a who had a great listing. It's perfect for him. You know, as soon as they hit the market, you know, we we're talking. He's like, "Yeah, look, you know." So well, they go to sell these. They don't promise them is uh, they can't find anything to move into. They want to get themselves. And so that's another issue. You just have a whole lack of supply. How, how hard is it to like rezone the industrial real estate here? So if you're small, you can build something here. When you get, yeah, see, that gets into your development phase, right? Yeah. And you're repurposing phase, too. Because keep in mind, one thing, another thing we're seeing in retail is that you're seeing some of those spaces, like the Kmart stores, being converted to last mile distribution centers for Amazon. Yeah. Uh, another aspect, we don't see it a whole lot here, but we do have some of it on marketplace, where you're taking some of those little box stores and you're making them self stores. Right. Those are easier build outs, yeah. yeah. So, uh, there's one that I know somebody's looking at right now. They actually want to take it into apartments in the middle of the shopping center. It's got a little grocery store in there. Put apartments in it. So it becomes a very small multi use uh, neighborhood type of center. Right. Yeah, uh, questions now. I know that so when people are used to a residential transaction, it's been the same thing for the offer and the agencies. What's the process like for? I mean, can you like a uh, weather can mm -hmm. you talk us through like what that process is and mm -hmm. how it differentiates yeah. from us now? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, usually what happens if we identify a property and we want to go after it, we'll submit a letter of intent. And the letter of intent lays out the basic negotiation terms, you know, price, uh, feasibility period, you know, things of that nature. Okay. Lays that out. And so let's hash all that out before we even get the attorneys involved. 
know, let's get that done, make sure we're all on the same page. Then we go to actual contract. And then the contract goes through, but, and the contract will be there. We'll go back and forth a little bit on that. And we don't do the residential side, we probably see them in the commission. We do what we call web management documents. So we can track all the changes and comments. And so we'll do all that. And then, and usually it's the brokers, sometimes the attorneys that get involved with that aspect, it depends on what's being negotiated. Then after that, we actually send it to the attorneys. Attorneys are not practitioners. You know, one thing that I hear a lot about residential. So I had an attorney draft a contract somewhere there from liability. Attorneys aren't practitioners in our market. You know, they're there looking at from the legal aspect. I have a lot of attorneys that the clients that come in want to buy or sell something or buy something like, or somebody's trying to buy something then. And, and they're asking the attorney's question. The attorney said, we'll talk to Tom. Is that the right price? I don't know. Is that the right terms? I don't know. Yeah. They're looking out from the legal aspect. It's our job to look at from the practitioner's professional aspect. And this same thing. So I can go back and forth on some nuances and negotiations and contract. But then I tell every one of my clients, now let's have the attorney with you for the legal aspect. So I'm going to help them to save them $500 an hour. And instead of having the attorney also get the issues. So, what if, like, let's say that you have a bunch of syndicators from there and they want to waste money? Um, mm -hmm. So, if y'all like interview that process and say, you know, I said, well, sure, we'll go get you basis capital, like, how does that process work? Um, you do. List of stuff, list and of syndication can hurt you in this market because obviously property declines so quick. Because if you have to syndicate the funds, it's going to take you a while. Yeah. You know, you can't close in six weeks on the property. So, the best thing you can do is actually raise the capital now and then find some inputs. And then you can always go back and send it to the DOI afterwards. And that's one thing that I advise a lot of people to do. You think that they can pay. But if I'm represented the owner of the property, and that's a question I ask every offer that comes in there. Is this going to be a syndication? What's your ability to close? Because a lot of them, here's the thing, some of them can put 60 days in the contract. And they're not closing in 60 days. They find out later that they're going to send it. So, I'm like, I need to go to the Yeah, exactly. You just hide up the property. And that, that gives you a bad reputation. So, if you do get through with that, and that 60 day closing becomes six months, yeah. you know, uh, well, one, if I'm representing the owner, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Because I'm going to say, okay, your money goes hard, your money goes hard. Like every 30 days, you're putting up a lot more money. Yeah. And then after so many times of doing that, I'm going to say this money is non-refundable and will not be applied to the purchase price. We had a client like, representing a seller. Well, actually, it started about four years ago. Uh, somebody did that to a property he had. And then this was a very simple and stuff like that. And all these issues came up. First, we just said, okay, hard money. By the end of the deal, I raised them another $187,000 on top of the purchase price. Uh, you know, for, I think it was an 18 month extension, is what I remember. And <laughs> by the end of it, he's like, hey, tell them, tell them, I hope they don't close. I mean, I'll keep taking these payments every month, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, so okay, they have to get the raise money. Like, what's the due diligence stage you said it was like? Where, uh, Commercial, like how long is it? Like, what, what, what's all that entail? Let's say it's multi family. Okay, multi family, uh, especially in our feasibility, I mean, reasonably, could be 30 to 60 days. You know, I mean, you should be able to get everything done by the end. Uh, when you're touring the property initially, don't expect to see every unit, you know, both the tenants and all that. So you see a couple units get a feel for it. However, during your feasibility, one, we usually don't use uh, a commercial inspector. We use tradesmen in the market. So you bring in an HVAC person, you bring in, and you can bring in a general contractor can identify issues and say, hey, you need an electrician to really work with those and stuff like that. Which, right? So you go through that process. You also, during your feasibility period, make sure you do see every single unit. Right. And Case in point, I was representing a buyer on a multi-family deal several years ago. We did our nurse came the first walk and said, oh, okay, this looks great. And they said, well, this one unit uh, is gutted, you know, completely gutted, has renovations. All right. Well, 
Well, literally a week before, well, during our inspections, I insisted on seeing it again. And they kept saying, oh, well, we can't find the keys to these and that everything else. So a week before, I said, look, we're pulling out the stuff we don't see. So we went and saw, like, five of the units, we, you know, we're talking about completely together. We're talking down to the sub floor, CSM, yeah, the fun stuff, you name it. And I'm like, this isn't what you said. You know, you know, so. so I wanted to advise my client on a $3 million deal. <laughs> I advised my client the, the day before closing, the, uh, the day before the end of feasibility, we just needed that money. Wow. You see a lot of like future like they say that you could trade your stuff and put an offer and get good and face and you know, like lower like you see that a lot in commercial. Like for instance, like if you're putting an offer and you do your dealer's face, well You think the repairs are gonna be yeah, so three hundred thousand ends up being five hundred thousand. You can and a good listing agent is, should be able to just wanna tell you. Because if they have any respect for you, and this is where the CCIM comes into play, by the way. If they have enough respect for it, they know that you're going to discover all this during the yeah. right. right? So they need to tell you that and hopefully price the property for you. And I've got one property. And again, a lot of it's who do you know and things. I've got an issue right now. Uh, a buyer was looking at this $3 million office complex for instance, the purchase, right? And I called the agent up and we're talking. He just looked to him. It's the, the sellers. It, the sellers are also the occupants. They want to downsize, so basically the whole half of the half of the building is going to be conveyed on the seller. Because, and I'm trying to explain that to the sellers because he knows I'm going to do the price analysis, right? Right. So, so the uh, in, including that, because look, they're trying to sell it as if it's fully occupied as an investment building. So I advise my clients to get rid of that. But that's that thing. I'm not going to waste his time. I'm not going to waste mine. I'm not going to waste clients' time. And he's not going to waste his. Yeah, so when it comes down to funding, what are the criteria? What do you need to have in the room to be able to qualify to purchase the building? <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Okay. It depends on one type of deal. And two, your experience as well. Uh, now, if you're buying multifamily, for instance, if you're a serious operator and you say, hey, look, we have a thousand units under our belt, and then it's like, okay, you know what you're doing. So you want to feel more comfortable in that deal. But usually, depending on the type of loan and everything, usually you're looking anywhere from, it could be as low as 15%, especially on multifamily, to up to 30%. Uh, we use, if your credit's good, we generally advise our clients that are new into it, expect 25% plus steward and the things you get to keep in mind the feasibility costs more than commercial. And the lender's probably going to require an environment that could be $1,500 to thousands of dollars. Yeah. Appraisals are a whole lot, cost a whole lot more. Right. And calling in favors usually I can get a simple one for $1,500. And then it's still going to take a lot of six to eight weeks. Oh, it's a lot longer. And that's for a small property. I can give you an idea. That's a 4,400 square foot flex space that I have there. And that part, and calling it a favor, they did $15,000. And they said, well, it's not going to be a full blown appraisal. It's fine. So we're going to pay any price in the kind of peaking and right thing. <laughs> but one of the things I do too, uh, I do valuations for a lot of people. So I'm not an appraiser. But similar to BPOs, just a lot more in depth. And I've done hundreds of them. So uh, I'm also recruited a certified commercial real estate association. So they're, in commercial, they do a thing called uh, the you'll see you'll hear call features. So essentially, a lot of them are three year, five year calls. That's where they can call you back in. They can do they can either call them in completely, so it's like so you gotta go on refinance. Or they just want to make sure that everything's still in order. You know, and uh, back when interest rates were stable, you know, they weren't really calling the know that they want to make sure that all your financials are still in order, the property's still a good property, it's still a good deal in the books. Now, look for a lot of those things to get called as the So 
speaking of that, um, so I asked <laughs> everyone this question. Do you think we're in a housing bubble? And I feel like at every time you ask that question all the time, it's fine. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. I don't. Uh, interest rates are going to help stabilize the market. Keep in mind from a residential standpoint, there's a, a stable market. That means it's not a buyer's market or a seller's market, right? It's considered six months of interest rates in the market. People don't realize that. So, and if we get to 30 days and people start three months, no, we're still, it's still a seller's market. Yeah. So it just keeps going. Interest rates will eventually have a thing. The affordability index is going to so prices may be going up. But you have to look at the affordability index. Wages have gone through the roof. And inflation is a huge problem. Inflation is an issue, but wages are going up with that, right? So it's, you can afford more homes. You know? And I mean, I look at some of the homes that some of these young people are buying right now. Holy crap! Yeah, <laughs> it is wild. Yeah, and uh, so pay attention to that. VAR actually puts up. Uh, Numbers on that to be are the economic uh, the economic advisor group on that. So they'll send out a communication on that. So just subscribe to that. And how much? So subscribe. Are you, are you a realtor? Yes. Then it's free. So what happens if you're not a realtor? I don't. You hope you your friend reads it to you. Just uh, <laughs> curious. But you're going to be a realtor. No, so it's true. I have got plenty of friends. Somebody realtors. else probably is. <laughs> so. Until that happens. Yeah. Uh, but pay attention to that. She does a great job, Lisa. Um, she's actually the chief economist for VAR. And yeah, she does a great job talking about that type of stuff. So just really pay attention to that. Our marketplace, though, keep in mind, we're kind of insulated compared to a lot of places in the market, too. Uh, the military helped stabilize our market during the Great Recession. I mean, we still fell, but we weren't drastically hit like Vegas and Florida and places like that. So, that's very important. Yeah, our biggest weakness is always the government and uh, the government. What do you think the healthy is going to really affect you? All right. I, uh, I tend to stay away from politics because <laughs> somebody out there is going to stop doing business with me. Well, oh, this That's is business. I'm going to tell you physically, I'm very conservative. So, so and do you think I'm a big believer in capitalism and the people you know, kill what you eat, right? Uh, you know, you work for something. I don't believe they're all entitled to, uh, and I don't believe that those societies really work. I mean, they don't see innovation in the society. So there are some good policies coming through. Uh, probably the biggest forecast of industry that I can advise everybody on is pay attention to the cannabis industry. Yeah. The cannabis industry, whether you agree with it or not, is changing our dynamics. Our, you know, it's going to really substantially change everything. When Colorado first legalized, CCIM did a study, and they had a direct high correlation between uh, what we call absorption. So, in other words, vacancy dropping for retail space and cannabis stores. Now, the most brilliant part of all that was the girl that did the Girl Scout cookies right outside the store. Right? <laughs> she needs to come. I want her to come to work for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> My God. So, this needs to be a meme. <laughs> so, yeah. So in Canvas, like I said, Canvas stores in the area, are they going to emphasize a lot of storage for manufacturing? It's going to be more like a retail. Well, right now, because for the most part, Canvas retail is not legalized right now in the state of Virginia, right? Right. It's decentralized. So, yeah, but in other words, you can't go up in a store and sell. Yeah. Not yet, but I think they, they were on track for two years once they do come They're trying to, yeah. Something. That's the plan. Yeah. And so right now, what you've seen, uh, actually one of the things the Manchester Industrial says was a lot of grill shops for hemp, for CBD and stuff. And hemp. Uh -huh. But this, but it also prepares them to start growing when that does become legal. Right. The other thing is... A lot of these grow stores for the hydroponics because you grow your own now at home. So these have exploded everywhere. And some of the people, if you, if you haven't noticed this, you see a lot of hookah shops that are open up. Yeah. That's the front line you know, to get in front of when cannabis becomes legalized. So it becomes a weed store. So where do you see the market in six months? Uh, uh, much higher interest rates. <laughs> <laughs> higher interest rates, lower buying. Well, 
We have slowed down a little bit. Um, interest rates, of course, are going to impact things. Cap rate, you know, eventually cap rate questions. Uh, we're going to have to see how our cap rates to adjust for that. But right now, you know, with inverted yield curves, um, people might be saying, hey, you know, we're going to go up and come back down. But for the most part, the sentiment, not to institutional sentiment, isn't really going to do that. Okay, we're not going to bubble out the crash and then drop rates way back down. But we do need to take some drastic measures on the interest rates to slow things down. Wages are out of control. Everything's out of control. How much does it, year the construction business, how much does it cost you for lumber? You know, oh, that's ridiculous. Or steel, or any of your supplies. If you keep back more than I would almost double the cost over the pandemic. And it keeps going like this. I don't even know where it's at right now. I mean, we have to keep a mark up in like a year period. That's horrible. Yep. And uh, there's large, lar very large contractors. There's a subscription service that they subscribe to, and it does things like tracking cost of materials and supplies and stuff like that. And everything on that truck was, you know, I, I have to do it. I'm going to the CCIM conference. And I'm like, wow, everything on there was just, they were talking about steel and everything. And it's just, you know, we need to look at how much cost of the labor now. Well, there's a huge um, shortage in construction workers alone. You have a lot of people that are in their 60s and getting ready to retire, and you don't have that influx of the younger yeah. generation because the past probably, what, 20 years they've been joining college, 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 That's right. trades. And we're going to be running into a huge issue in the next probably less than 10 years, 10 to 15 years. And we really need to promote trades again to our people because. People that went to college and tradesmen that still exist are going to get paid the same thing because of uh, an urgency. They went without debt because the company couldn't keep trades for them. Exactly. Yeah. And that's true. I mean, yeah. I've got a buddy who owns a very large HVAC company in the Cincinnati area. And he was telling me, he's starting, if you have no experience, you know, fresh out of high school, yeah. you're starting at like 15, 18 bucks an hour and training them. And paying for their school. And then once you're done with all that, you get a big bump. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you're going for like 25 bucks an hour. Wow, you know, I'm thinking about how much it costs me to go through school. But, yeah. so, well, education costs a lot of too. You know? I mean, it's just so. Yeah, we've got to do something about all that. We've got to slow things down a little bit. We got to take care of our supply chain issues. But that's another reason that when you're looking at for inflation, so if you go, and we're going to go higher inflation. Uh, you know, I, I said a year ago, a year and a half ago, that we're going to go back to 1970s inflation. Everybody thought that was full of crap. But now you look at it, we're at 1981, and we're going even further. Yep. So, looking at all that, we're going into, I expect that we're going to go back to 1970s. And there's still economic drivers there. You know, if you guys are young, you don't remember, it's actually a little bit from my time, but the gas lines. Gas was the big supply chain issue. Okay, well, we have supply chain issues now. So, that's one thing to justify it. There's just so many different factors that go into this. And we have to take control. The feds were slow in moving, they should have reacted sooner. And now that the time the curve, hence the 30 days to come next. I agree with you. You're not the only one saying that either. There are a lot of people saying that. That is one of the first. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it's just like retail. I read an article a year ago, a few years ago, talking about retail's not dead, it's changing. Same yeah. thing with office space. Office space went through the roof, it surpassed industrial sales last year. Wow. Well, one reason is because nobody's selling the post right now. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, and I said, look, it's just changed. And especially in the suburbs, which, you know, again, some article I wrote on that talked about, look, it's changing. You're going to see office, office or companies are going more to the suburbs where the people are. Uh, instead of putting, you know, a thousand people in a tower, they're doing, off, they're doing centers in different suburban areas, smaller locations. Go back to the office. We are social. We are social people. Yeah. You think about it too. It lives in the Wall Street Journal. They wrote an article on this talking about, you know, the height of COVID, and everybody's like, "Oh, nobody's going back to work again." And they said, "No. How do managers train your up and coming managers? You can't do that over Zoom. You've got to be around them. You've got to listen to what's going on. You know, like you said, in on that meeting with you yesterday, Rob. Yes. You've got to hear what's being said. Oh, that's how you react to that. Mm -hmm. That's how you train up and coming people." That's one reason why, well, one, CCIM, for instance, they require you to do deals. You can't just be an academic and be up there and be kind of CCIM. You have to do deals, okay? 
Uh, same thing with my training program. You know, I don't sit here and just have people just crunch numbers all day long. You know, it's on the job. They're going on listening appointments with me. They're doing, you know, they're sitting on you know, fire appointments, you name it. So you got to learn how to do all that. I think one of the, uh, we just got back to the conference, one of the things they said about housing, uh, mobile, they were saying that it's a uh, price that you want to compare to what? And they were comparing like the housing prices, like back in the day, comparing against uh, gold and oil to what they are now. And I was like, huh, it's actually a really good comparison. Maybe housing isn't that high compared to what I thought it was a great, it's a great point. analogy. Yeah. But yeah, we need the wage index compared to the average wage yeah. index too. Yeah, they were talking about how much people yeah. made then, so what people made now, and it was actually a good index. And I go buy this investment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, a couple of good things to follow up instead of following, um, talking about the job claims and stuff, follow the ADP index. Because they're the ones that do the payroll for all these companies. Uh, that's the point. So, Very good point. Yeah. See, so keep in mind, jobless and uh, you know, unemployment rate only counts people who are actively working for jobs. So that's an issue. I mean, if you take yourself out of the workforce, yeah, if you take yourself out of the workforce, they don't count you. That's not part of the job list. So ADP, you know, they'll show this growth and stuff going on on payrolls, right? Because they go processing payrolls. So that's really cool. Another thing is um, one of my favorite economic economists. He's also the chief economist for for CCIM, by the way, uh, KC Conway, and. He has a company called Rich Hue Diaries, where you can go in there and follow that. And CCIM, we just launched, and I tell you, you know, disclosure here, I haven't looked at it yet, uh, but we just launched our own inflationary index. We put we did, a bunch of them got together, some of the top CCIMs in the world, and economists and everybody got together and said, look, what criteria should we really be tracking? And they launched, and that's free. You go, I believe if you go to CCIM.com, Website, it might be there. If not, I will find it. All right. But that's great. You can start tracking that from that perspective. So, with everything going inflation, all this stuff, where do you feel like it's the biggest opportunity? Let's say, for, let's say someone comes in and they want you to uh, consult them and say, hey, where's the biggest opportunity? Most risk averse. Or risk averse? Risk averse. Like family. Family. Okay. You got to make sure your numbers are right. Yeah. Right? Uh, see, one of the issues of buying the other asset class is the place and rising. In a rising interest rate market, are most of your commercial tenants, other than multifamily, are usually on multi year leases. Yeah. Okay. So if you got somebody that's locked in at a 2% annual escalation over the next five years, with the option to renew for another five years for 2% increases, you know, you're going to be behind the curve in a couple of years on investment. The so you've got to really pay attention to your future cash flow analysis rather than just cash rate. You know, but the flip side too, on multifamily, so that'd be terrible, right? Is can you really see rents continuing to go? I tend to err on the conservative side of my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the accounting principle. You know, you underestimate revenue and overestimate expenses, right? right. So multifamily, you gotta look at that. And one thing that I always look at as well, I believe that too many people don't look at this part of the equation. What's the space worth if it's vacant? And that property on George Washington, since that's a, it's probably with a whole lot more right now as user space than it because it's a signalized intersection in the park at the same time. Yeah. So look at that from an appreciation standpoint. Uh, you know, a certain area around here, I know you guys are looking at property with yourself, I'll say that out loud. There's <laughs> other investors I'm going to try to jump on, but a certain area in our market, it's going to really get through a huge national level of development aspect, right? So if you're so if you're fortunate enough to get into some property close to that, you know, you could really you know, in five years have a valuable piece, have a very valuable asset in your hands. Not only from a rent growth perspective, but you know, just the land itself So of course if it's multifamily, then it's all going to be based on income. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's my biggest ad was uh, commercial rather than residential because uh, it's all based on numbers and you don't feel like my body is residential it's like some of the stuff like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well and funding yeah. is different too yeah. when you're doing residential versus commercial yeah. because you know, it's all about your DCR yep. with residential That's right. the coverage ratio yeah. that coverage ratio is based off the annual operating income for those of you that don't know out there. And that stands for your net operating income. That does not include your personal income taxes, the 
It does not include your debt, and it does not include capital expenses. So, you know, if when you're looking at it, you're going to go, hey, I'm putting a new roof on. Well, that's a depreciable expense. That's capitalized. That is not an operating expense. So know the difference. The flip side is that you can also do uh, segmented cost analysis. This takes a specialist to do this. That's where you can accelerate a lot of depreciation. So your return in the first couple of years can be very advantageous. For your underwriting, I see a lot of lenders, or I've heard of a lot of lenders, they're putting their cap tax reserves above the line rather than below the line. Why? What's your opinion on that? That's on the property. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so it's like a, it's a 2000 bill, and they're saying that they're putting the, let's just say, $300 per door, which is a little bit higher than what a 2000 bill should be above the line and below the line. Is that something that you'd ask a lender, like, hey, why are you doing this? Or is that just... Because it might be... Yeah, I mean, you can ask the lender. Ask, don't be afraid to ask the lender what's going on. Yeah, right? I mean, it's funny. Too many people get intimidated, especially more investors. They get intimidated when you're speaking to a lender or when you're speaking to, you know, commercial brokers. Ask the questions, you know. Uh, it's similar to the wine discussion we were having the other day. Yes. But we were talking about, ask the sommelier. And what's a good selection? And give them a price cap. Yeah, so that's what they're there for. They love doing that. Now, lenders and brokers may not love explaining everything. <laughs> okay, but that's what we're here for. Yeah. yeah. You know, don't be afraid to ask the questions. And if you've got somebody that doesn't give you the answers, unless they are your only source of funding, walk away. Find somebody else. Yeah, one thing that I didn't know about commercial agents is. What, what research y'all had for like a certain property? So you have a certain property, you can see like what's the best case, like this aspect of the deal. Let's so say you have much property. Okay, well maybe a food industry is the best one. So that's one thing I can realize. Okay. That commercial, commercial agents have. Can you kind of explain like the benefits of like that? A lot of people do that. I feel like I'm not. Well, we do more than yeah. A lot of residential agents look at a property and they'll see it. It's more of an intrinsic feel. You know, you're like, oh, this is a good location. You know that. You feel it. Well, in commercial, we actually research. We actually analyze that aspect. So we'll look at economic driving factors for the market. We'll look at population growth rates. We'll look at the demographics. We'll look at the rent growth and potential. We'll, we take all that into account, and we can actually research all that. Uh, whereas from a residential standpoint, you know, it, it's more of a gut feeling. Yes, yeah. because you know the area, you know the property. But I will still tell you though, you still need to look at the property. You still need to share. It's uh, so if I'm doing, if somebody asked me to look at someone in another, in another state or outside, completely, completely outside my market, for instance. You know, if I do it, but yeah, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to call up a local CCIM and say, hey, I'm looking at this property. Can you give me some idea? Now, Pay them for it, you know. You give me some idea of what's going on because you don't know. It's like, yeah, but guess what, Tim? You know, we know that this company is going to get this. And that's going to hurt. That's going to cost $1,200,000. Oh, okay. Right now, it may look like a great deal, right? Yeah. You well, know, that happens. Yeah. So, nothing beats putting something around you, but I was in the pocket. Same thing with land. I love land. I do a lot of development stuff. You got to walk the land, no matter what. Don't get, you know, you got to get out there and you got to walk. You can't just stand up one end of the property and go, okay, you got to walk the land, get a feel for it. Okay. Just curiosity when it comes to people underwriting now, talking about future projections and if jobs leave and jobs come, what should I be, or what should people who are underwriting forecast in regards to cap rates, in regards to, hey, I want to go off bridge and I'm going to refinance in three years, it's blocked um, right now. Yeah. In regards to that, what are some um, bad ideas that people are having right now that they should have? Well, one thing people are rushing into rushing into the real estate market, right? Uh, you know, saying, "Hey, we had twelve. You know, I'm here I got twelve point one percent rent growth on multifamily last year. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like, oh, I can keep getting that. So it's okay that I'm going to pay six or seven percent, uh, you know, rate. And it's like, yeah, what are you going to do five years or when it's called in two years, right? Years, right? And so your rates going to adjust. Uh, you're talking about the bridge line. Same thing with the, you know, you can actually get financing and have a call. 
and the yeah, radio had popped the and that's when we had to call them for years. You're like, oh crap, now I've got to refinance at 8 or 9 percent, and my rent record is only 7 now. So you just got to be careful. Make sure you, you, know, you do your numbers. Air on the conservative side. Yes, hey, I can get into this deal. Well, you know, sometimes you got to walk away from it. Like I said, don't. Yeah. We'll be able to sink and check. Yeah, you don't want to catch every ship to sell. I mean, it'd be nice if you catch every ship to sell. But you want to make sure you're on the ones that don't sink. And yes, you want to miss some opportunities that one will have. And I told you about the moment. And so it's going to happen. But the biggest thing is, you know, have a group of knowledgeable people that can work, you know, whom you trust. Uh, whether it's you know, brokers, lenders, you need know, to build that network, but you should be you know, the function of the team. And then let everybody in on what you think, you know, so give us your knowledge. Of so to wrap it up, do you have any deals that you'd like to discuss that you have currently right now? Sure. Well, I told you about the one of 4,000 years Western Highway. Uh, that's just a pure investment plan for the national tenant, 5% annual escalations, it's a nice intersection, it's very, you know, that very appreciation value. Uh, the other one that I have that might be of interest is this is a development deal, which is not great for everybody. And specifically, it should be geared for either Vitech or uh, or senior living centers, such as nursing homes. It is on the Upper Boulevard, right at the end, uh, down huge development. Um, it has 36,000 cars per day currently going through there. It's 11, it's over 11 acres. Yeah, and the real fight here. Is each, uh, it's a great opportunity to develop some large senior housing, not, not the younger housing, but large like senior housing, which means 55 and older, by the way, in the back end of the property. You sell off the, the road frontage part of the regular retail, and they'll recoup for about half your cost. The property is only on the market for 1.95. Okay. Yeah, I just ran into a, a guy at the, our conference in the he takes large luxury, luxury houses and converts them to senior living spaces. So, like, oh, yeah. It's uh, repurposing is a thing that I love doing. Yeah. So, you know, if you come across not just development, but deep development, for instance, where you take a box store and a shopping center and make it storage units, mm -hmm. it's a huge opportunity for that. And not everybody's thinking about yeah, that. Right. Be, be creative. Be creative, you know. Uh, that's, and that's one of the advantages of CCIMs, you know. That we try to put you in front of the market. Yeah. Not where it's been. We want to help you get in front of where it's going. Um, so, well, just kind of wrapping up. Uh, where can people find you? Find more about you? Learn more about CCIM? Uh, you can, uh, well, as far as CCIM, you can go to CCIM.com. You can find me on there too when you're searching for CCIM. Another thing, you can always just, uh, I'm, I'm big on social media. Do a Google search and find myself, and then there's a term in the future. Well, actually, it's a judge now. I'm going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> What's your <laughs> social media username? Uh, Timothy Churchwell. Okay. And you can also find me at Exit Realty Central in Norfolk, Virginia. And of course, you can contact anyone who's doing this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jack. Yeah. Tim, you're amazing as always. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for the opportunity. You guys have a great team going here. I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do. Awesome.